Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebrian, and you are watching part three in this series on variable practice. So if you didn't watch the first two parts, go watch them. I've put the links in the comments below so you understand what we're talking about and why we're talking about it. Um, so hopefully from those first two parts, you understand the concept of variable practice and you understand why and how it could be helpful to you. So let's talk about some ideas for actually how to use it in the practice room. So the most important thing, besides the fact that you wanna make sure that you're not introducing too much variability until you get to a high skill level, the most important thing is that this method of practicing is gonna work the best when the variability targets what's hard about what you're doing. So you have to really think for a given passage or a given skill, what is the most challenging aspect of this? So if you are playing something slow and lyrical, the most challenging aspect might be saving your bow for long enough if you're a string player or having enough air if you're a wind or brass player. If you're playing something fast, the challenge is playing fast, right? Coordinating all your movements really precisely at a really quick tempo. So you need to think very carefully about what the hardest aspect of the passage of the skill is and then tailor your var variability to that. So one of the classic ways to introduce variability in practicing is to practice in different rhythms. I talked about this a bunch in my videos on how to play faster, which I'll also link to um, in the description below. So the reason this works when you practice in dun, da dun, da dun, or da 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 da, or all the other rhythms that I talk about in those videos, is you force yourself to make the precision of your fingers or your lips or your arms or whatever you're using to be much more specific and much more fine-tuned and precise by introducing these different rhythm permutations. So that's sort of an obvious way to introduce variability. Another way to introduce variability that's also very common is to practice at different speeds. I talk about this in the video series on playing faster too. So this can be used for slow music and fast music. But again, think about what's hard about it. So when you're playing slow music, often what's hard is just the mechanics of sustaining a note for a long time, but it could also be, you know, sustaining the phrase and having the phrase really sustain over a long period of time and not feel all chopped up. So if you're practicing something slow, the variability you introduce might be to practice it even slower so that you really fine tune your ability to, to sustain notes. It might be that you practice it twice as fast to get a sense, a better sense of the overall shape of the phrase. That's something I do a lot with slow music. I'll practice it at double tempo and that will really help me feel um, how the phrase needs to connect from the beginning to the end and then I try to capture that when I'm at my slow tempo. If you're practicing something fast, yes, you probably wanna practice it at slower tempos to make it clean, but you also wanna make sure you practice it faster than your goal tempo, right? If your goal tempo is the maximum tempo you can play, that's gonna feel really scary. But if you practice faster than your goal tempo, then your goal tempo is gonna feel good. Another common way of introducing variability into practice is to practice using different slurring patterns or articulations. So for us as string players, when we introduce different slurring patterns or different combinations of slurs and separates, it changes the coordination between the bow and the left hand. And that can help you fine tune trouble spots um, because it's more challenging, right? And then when you do it separate bows or with the marked bowing, it feels a lot easier. Same thing with changing articulations. If something is supposed to be very smoothly slurred and you do it staccato or marcato or some short stroke, that's gonna change the coordination of your bow and your left hand, or if you're a wind or brass player, the articulation with your mouth and your fingers, and it will force you to fine tune that coordination so that when you do it slurred as written, it will be more precise and it will be better. That's just one example of how you could change articulations, but if something about the articulation or the coordination between slurs and separates, for instance, is the challenging thing, changing those is gonna give you more benefit than just doing it as written all the time. Another idea is to practice with different dynamics, either subtly different dynamics, so amplify the louds and make the softs like really soft, or the opposite dynamic of what you're doing. So change the dynamics and that might give you new musical ideas, but it will also push the limits of what you're capable of. So then you have more flexibility with doing the dynamics you actually intend to do. Somewhat related to changing dynamics is changing the tone color. So if you're gonna play something with a really bright sound, practice playing it with a really dark sound or a really covered sound. By changing the tone color, you have to use your body in a different way. You have to use your imagination in a different way. And that may reveal things to you about the way you're using your bow or your air or whatever 
that helps you refine the tone color as written, the way you intend to play it. For those of us that play with vibrato, changing your vibrato, varying your vibrato is a great way to practice. So if you want a passage to have really fast wide vibrato, really passionate vibrato, practice it with even faster, even wider vibrato, push the limits of what you're able to do with your vibrato. Or like I was talking about with dynamics, use the complete opposite vibrato. See what that sounds like. See if you can control the sound and you can control the phrasing that way. And again, it will give you more flexibility with what you want to do. These next two ways are two of my favorites and credit for these goes to Dr. Noah Kageyama. So if you're not familiar with Dr. Kageyama and his website, Bulletproof Musician, you need to go there and read literally every single article on there. You need to subscribe and listen to his podcast. It's amazing beyond belief. I am a huge, huge, huge fan of his work. So these two ideas come from him. So thank you to him for these ideas. Um, so the first is to play your passage or whatever in different emotions. I love this one. I think this one is so much fun and I use it even when I'm solidifying something like mechanical, like a shift, like I'm just trying to solidify this shift. Every single repetition I do, I'll do it in a different emotion. So usually what I do is I'll do the emotion of the passage or my intended emotion first as clearly as I can. So if it's a very joyful passage, I'll, I'll try to make it sound like as happy as possible. And then my next one, I try to do the opposite. So if it's a happy passage, I'll try to make it sound angry on my next repetition. And then maybe I'll try to make it sound sad or wistful or whatever. Um, so I, I do as many different emotions as I can think of. And I actually find that the ones that are the opposite of the intended emotion are the most fun because they're the most challenging. And sometimes I discover really interesting things. Sometimes when I have done the opposite emotion, it sounds more like what I actually want it to sound like than when I do the intended emotion, which is super interesting, but it helps me learn like, oh, when I play this happy passage angry, it actually sounds happier, huh? I wonder why that is. And then I have to investigate and it's because I'm using a different articulation or a different vibrato or something that actually matches better what I'm, what I'm going for. Um, but even if I don't, you know, discover those kind of surprising things, doing it in a bunch of different emotions is fun. It's interesting. Um, and it helps you gain more flexibility even on mechanical things. So that's one. The second one, again, this is from Dr. Kakuyama is to, play something impersonating different musicians. Um, so in his classes, um, he will have people try to channel famous musicians and not like pretend to be them, like pretend you're being possessed by them. And so if I was going to play and pretend to be Yo-Yo Ma, like how would it sound? How would I look to be like Yo-Yo Ma? Yo-Yo Ma always has this big smile on his face, right? When he's playing happy music. So try to embody everything about that performer and then play the passage as if you're them. I have found that it doesn't matter if you do this only sticking to performers of your instrument, or if you choose performers that play something completely different than what you do. It seems to work equally well. I also had an, uh, an experience in a masterclass once where I was gonna have a student do this, and I asked him to name his favorite violist, and he said he didn't have one. There's probably a viola joke there. But I was like, okay, well, what about a violinist? He didn't have one. What about a cellist? He didn't have one. I was like, okay, what about any musician? He didn't have one, which is kind of concerning in and of itself. And I was like, okay, what, what about like, I don't know, a performer in any field? And he was like, Michael Jordan. I was like, oh, okay. Um, play this passage like you're Michael Jordan. I had no idea if it was gonna work. It was amazing, actually. He played really well playing his viola like he was Michael Jordan. So this seems to work even with people that don't even play music, impersonating them. Uh, but again, it's a really, really fun way to introduce variability into your practicing, and it's very, very effective. So highly recommended to try that. The last idea I wanna give you is something that I especially enjoy doing with young children, and that is introducing physical challenges into their repetitions. Um, and these are physical challenges that make it a little more difficult to do what you're doing, but without like getting hurt or making it impossible to play the piece. So I will, you know, we'll be reinforcing some little section in their, in their piece, and I will ask them to do it standing on one foot. You know, we'll do it standing on the right foot, then standing on the left foot. Then we'll do it crouching down in a, in a squat on the floor. Then we'll do it up on their toes. Then we'll do it spinning around in a circle. There's so many ways that you can use this. My kids always come up with really, really inventive ways of using their body in sort of a different way while they're doing, while they're doing the repetitions. 
So I love this because one, it's just a lot of fun to do this, to try to, you know, play while you're balancing on one foot. Um, but also the addition of these physical challenges takes some of your attention away from playing your piece because you're trying to balance and not fall over. Or if you're, you know, you're walking in circles, you're trying not to crash into anything. And so it's testing to see, can you still do this thing when your attention is sort of taken away a bit from actually playing? And it, it really helps you refine the skill. It also gives you the confidence that, you know, okay, yeah, I can do this when I'm, you know, standing in, in tree pose or something like that and not fall over. It gives you the confidence that when you're in a performance situation and your attention may be distracted by, you know, some noise going on in the audience, that you can still play well because you've given yourself those distractions in the practice room. So these are just a few ideas for how you can introduce variability into your practice. I'm sure you guys can come up with way more ways, lots of creative ways. If you have a creative way of using this or you've come up with something, please put it in the, in the comments below so other people can see it, so I can see it and I can get more ways to use in my practicing. But again, it seems like, at least according to the research, when your skill level is low, you don't want to introduce that much variability because it's already really variable. You're just gonna make it too hard for yourself. But the better you get at something, the more variability you want to introduce and then it will make you better at the skill and you'll do better in a performance situation. So have fun experimenting with this method of practicing and as always thanks for watching.